The six Miami bandsmen left the Castle Ballroom in Banbridge just before two this morning. One travelled north to visit friends in County Antrim. The remaining five drove south to Dublin and straight into a carefully prepared ambush. In 1975, a Loyalist gang disguised as UDR soldiers carried out one of the worst atrocities of the Troubles. Two UVF paramilitaries were killed by their own bomb. In the moments that followed, three musicians from the Miami show band were hunted down and shot dead. The Miami Massacre, as it became known, shocked Ireland. It devastated lives. Stephen Travers survived that terrible night. For over 30 years, he's lived with the memory of his murdered Miami friends. He may be known as a survivor, but would prefer to be simply a bass player. You know, when you found what you want to do. Once I discovered music, it gave me a purpose in life. I'd get up really early in the morning just to look at the bass guitar. I couldn't play it at the beginning, but I just sat there looking at it. Stephen, uh, well, a terrible, terrible night, and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute or two, if, if you can. But maybe begin at the beginning, uh, the bass. Oh, the bass is uh, probably the uh, only thing I ever did really well in my life. Um, uh, one day, this young fella knocked on our door. Uh, Chelsea was was selling his bass guitar because, as he said, he couldn't make head or tail of it. He said he, he bought it because it, it had four strings. He thought it would be that bit easier. To play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is not, not quite true, although this one has five. I tried to handicap myself. There's no head or tail in this one. It's a challenge. <laughs> um, so, uh, and they said that if I could come up with half the money <coughs> for this bass guitar that Chelsea would sell me his and I'd be on my way. I'd start playing bass with them. And uh, they, they were looking for it. Chelsea wanted the, the, the princely sum of five pounds for the guitar. So you can imagine it wasn't a spell of ours. And my, I, I pestered my dad for two pounds and ten shillings. I, I, I didn't have a case, didn't have anything. So I ran home with it and I played it really, really badly. It was dreadful, but I, I thought it was wonderful. And I played it uh, until, until blisters came up. You know, when you were playing with it. And blisters came up and then I played it until the, the blisters burst and then my fingers got harder. And I was looking for for um, <coughs> something that would improve what they call the technique. So I learned my scales and I read on um, a magazine, an American jazz magazine, that if you played some Irish tunes, um, that your, your technique would improve. So I, I started to play things like, um, um, I hope I can remember it now. I tried to play with people who were better than me so that I could learn. In 1974, uh, the, uh, the most glamorous band, it's hard to, when you look up here, you see this fellow with a bus pass, it's hard to understand that I was once in one of the most glamorous bands in the country. 
I was a little bit of a musical snob. I was very much into jazz. I was, I was, I was more inclined to play the. Rather than the pop stuff, and um, but when I joined, when I joined the band, I just couldn't believe the talent that was in it. Well, well that's uh, on the left hand side there. You've got uh, before the thing comes down. You've got Brian McCoy from Caledon. Um, Raider is there in the front. Uh, Des is in the middle, and there beside. Brian, you've got Fran O'Toole now. A lot of the ladies will remember Fran O'Toole. He was, he was like Ireland's David Cassidy, and some of the younger people might say, "Who the hell is David Cassidy?" <laughs> <laughs> but he was a phenomenally talented singer. In fact, Phil Lind from Thin Lizzy once told me he said Fran O'Toole is the greatest soul singer that Ireland has ever produced. He was also a fabulous um, keyboard player, a jazz keyboard player. And a great songwriter with, with Des that wrote most of the songs. And on the extreme right is uh, one of the greatest musicians I've ever come across in my life. His name is Tony Garrity. He was a, a quiet little fella, uh, impish sense of humour, um, fantastic guitar player. Um, and of course, hard to believe that's me there with uh, beside them. Um, and we we played six, sometimes seven nights. We remember we did one time. We did 27 nights on the trot without, without a break. Um, and we played to uh, all sections of the community. We were a mixed band. And there was certainly, when, when people come to see, came to see the Miami show band, sectarianism was left outside the door. Um, and nature took its course. We, we were probably the ultimate matchmakers because we brought people together and uh, and, and uh, so just to put a human face on people the next time that you uh, that somebody mentions the Miami show and I hope you know a little bit more about the about the human beings that are in it because this coming Monday will be the the forty um, second anniversary of the night that I uh, that I, I watched them uh, been slaughtered through the madness that took over this this part of the country. Um, I hope that we never ever go back to it. As I say, if if we serve no other purpose than to highlight this awful thing that we must avoid in future, uh, I hope tonight will be uh, will bring bring that message to you. And thank you very much for listening. a little bit about how that unfolded or is it too difficult to bore details but we played in Banbridge I'm sure some of you might, might remember Castle Ballroom yeah. in Banbridge and, um, and so after the gig we were there was five of us just the top five there were driving we were to drive back down to Dublin um, and um, as we as we headed down down towards Newry, um, we were stopped at, at, at a roadblock. Um, yeah, it was uh, a man flagged us down. Brian was driving, and we were because it was a relatively short journey. Um, uh, we didn't. There was nobody was falling asleep at the back. Normally, I would sit up beside Brian uh, because we were both insomniacs, but. Um, this time I stayed in the back seat talking to Tony and they were playing cards. So we were surprised when, I suppose maybe not too surprised. I had, it was all a new adventure to me. And we, this, this man in a, in a UDR uniform told us that uh, he wanted to do a check on the, on the van. So they told us to pull in off the, onto the side of the road, and which, we, which Brian did, he pulled in and he said, I'll have to pull in tight because there's a car coming up behind us at speed. And we next thing they told us that we had to get out of the of the and this was the first time I had experienced this, but not the others. And we got out uh, and there were I could see about five soldiers, but I believe there were about ten. 
and they were they were asking us, and they told us to stand at the side of the at the side of the road, and there's a, a, a field in front of us. There's about a three meter drop down into the field, and we had to put our hands on our heads. Again, I thought it was just a a big adventure, and. Um, one man with a, a, a notebook was, uh, was taking our names and addresses. There was another man who appeared to be in charge. And um, when he was taking our names and addresses, um, they asked, I was in the middle, and Fran was at the end, Tony was beside me on my left, Des was, or Brian was on my right, and Des was very close to the van. The van just then, I heard some people at the back of our van. Now, on a Volkswagen minibus, the engine is in the back, and, but there's a little shelf, there's a, a little flap that you can open, and there's a little shelf on it, and all we brought in that van was our guitars, because we're very precious about them. We wouldn't give them to the road manager, so Tony's guitar and my guitar were on, on a shelf there, and Desert sax. And when I heard these people opening and they clicked the cases. Uh, very foolishly, because I had no experience in this, I, I took my hands down and I turned around and I walked back to the to, to where the soldiers were. And I said, um, can you be careful with that, please? And that's my guitar. Thinking that he'd be impressed. But um, he, he pointed at a small brown case that we had. It was like a little school, old-fashioned school case. And he asked me, he said, uh, what's in that? And I said, there's effects pedals, little, and it was unusual at the time for a bass player. And I used a wall wall pedal, and I think called an octave divider, which is a, threw you down an octave, which is like an effects. And um, he said, are there any valuables in it? And I said, no. And he turned me around and punched me in the back. But this time he punched me, instead of being in the center, he, he punched me between Dennis, now on my right, and Brian on my left. So I was now second, uh, closest to the van. And all of a sudden, there was this massive bang. I couldn't, it wasn't like a boom, it was a, the onomatopoeia would be a bang. It was very, very loud bang. And the whole world turned red, it was like like a blood orange, that's what I felt I was experiencing, it was like this amazing sunset or, uh, I'd never seen anything that was that type of red and I tried to run uh, but I couldn't there was, I couldn't get a purchase, I had actually been, the bomb, there was two men planting a bomb secretly under the driver's seat um, and it they accidentally triggered their own bomb and they blew themselves up. I mean, there was nothing left of them. One of the, one of the men, well, the, the, you can imagine the, the, the degree of, of, of injury. There was no heads, legs, anything like that. Um, and they were blown, one of them was blown out into the field, the other was, was blown down the road. But I tried to run and I was in the air and they told me I was shot while I was in the air. And I began to move down through the bushes into the field. And it was like I was in slow motion. You were like falling? I was falling down because I was blown up first into the air. And then I was falling down through this ditch, the hedge. And I felt that I could count every single leaf and twig that was touching me through my toes. I suppose it's a, a sense of heightened awareness of perhaps adrenaline, I don't know what does that. But all of a sudden I hit the ground very hard and two others fell on top of me. Uh, I think it may have been Brian and Tony, I'm not sure. But the minute they hit the ground, they somebody picked me up and dragged me a few feet into the, into the field. Uh, but I was a dead weight. I had been shot. I had actually been shot in the, in the right hip 
and it traveled, uh, it ex it's, it's an explosive bullet and it, it designed to cause maximum damage. And when it entered me, it, it, it exploded into 16 or 18 pieces and the remainder of it traveled through my body, up through my left lung and out under my left arm. So they thought I was dead. And just then the soldiers jumped down into the, into the field, followed us into the field and they, they killed Brian very quickly. He was, he, we think Brian was the one that was trying to drag me out. Now if you consider that I was a, a Catholic from South Tipperary and this man was a, a Protestant son of a member of the Orange, Orange Order in, in, in Tyrone. Uh, religion, politics meant nothing to us. We knew nothing about them. But he was murdered right beside me. And um, I then I heard Fran, our man there, second uh, second on the on, on the on the left. Um, I heard him crying not to be not to be not to be murdered. But um, they shot Fran twenty two times, and about seven or eight of those. Um, shots were in the face and completely took off his head. <coughs> um, Brian, uh, Fran Tony, at the, my friend, the guitar player, uh, they they shot him in the in the in, in the body, and, and he had his hands up to to protect himself. And these fabulous hands that were only maybe two hours before had been playing this incredible music on the guitar. The, the bullets went through his hands and, and uh, um, I pretended to be dead when the soldier was going around he was kicking the bodies to check that, they were, that everybody was dead and he stood beside Brian and he started kicking him <coughs> fairly violently and then he walked towards me and my face was to the ground um, I didn't feel any pain um, and I could feel the dew on my face and uh, my dilemma was do I, do I stand up and beg for my life or do I pretend to be dead and luckily I, I, I pretended I, I stayed where I was and I heard the footsteps come towards me and just as he approached me I, I had resolved that if he, if he fired into me that I wasn't going to move that I, would, I thought I'd be able to do that perhaps I wouldn't, I don't know but just as he approached me, there was a, a voice from the from the road shouted, "Come on! I got those bastards with dum dums. They're dead." Now, I didn't know what a dum 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 a dum dum is. This explosive bullet, but I didn't know that. I, in fact, I thought dum dums were were blanks, and that's why I didn't feel the pain. So instead of firing, he turned around and he walked. He walked away. And I thought every step that he takes, his aim is not going to be so good. And I, I was still resolved that I wouldn't cry out. But he didn't fire at all. He went back up onto the uh, onto the onto the road. And, um, but I knew that they were gone at this stage. So I turned on my back, and I we used to wear these ridiculous platform shoes at the time. It made you look about ten feet tall. And I, I, I remember clicking my, my soles of my feet together to see if, if my feet were okay. And um, I put my hands across my chest and I counted my fingers to see that I had that. Very important for a musician, obviously. My, I couldn't breathe properly because my lung had collapsed, the bullet had gone through it. And for about 45 minutes, I would stand up and fall down and stand up. And I crawled around to the three lads and I was, uh, I told him, look, Des has gone for help. He'll be back soon and we, we can all go home. Uh, and, you know, it, that's, you, you're, you're just not thinking straight and you're, you know, you're, you're in shock and all of these things. I mean, it's, it's um, I remember trying to uh, wake Brian and I couldn't wake him. I thought that he had been, so I, I told the others, Brian has been knocked out. I thought he'd been knocked out of the fall, but um, I just wouldn't accept they were dead. And uh, I remember telling Tony that he should count his fingers as well, that in, and tomorrow night, don't bring the Gibson, bring the Fender Telecaster tomorrow night, in case you hurt the fingers. There's been too, many, too much killing, too much suffering. 
I, um, she, in fact, I wish the man who had you know, perpetrated that could sit here beside us and tell you that this is a, 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 you know, let's all work together so that we can solve this, this thing. It should never happen again. And you'll be prepared to shake your hand if absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Show you. yeah. I think that's uh, all. Of it. Thank you very much indeed. Good night.